Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. Last time, we talked about human rights, which rights we really have, and which rights are just man-made constructs. We also mentioned that the purpose of rights is to give us moral obligations, not goodies, and that those obligations can teach us what actions are objectively right and wrong. However, figuring out which actions are objectively wrong is only step one of ethics, which, remember, is the art of avoiding evil and doing good. However, let me repeat that step one for those who missed the last episode. Step one of ethics. What am I doing? And is that action which I'm doing objectively evil? If this question is answered with a yes, then nothing else needs to be said. Actions that are objectively evil can never be done. Not for any reason. Because the first principle of ethics is avoid evil. Step two of ethics. If the action that I'm doing is objectively good, why am I doing it? Am I doing this good action with an evil intention? If the answer is yes, I may not do this act. A good example of this is giving someone a cake. That's a good action. But if your intention in giving them the cake is for them to find the bombs you were smuggling inside of it and break your gang of murderous thugs out of jail with them, well, that makes the action of giving them the cake evil. Therefore, you must never do that, as long as your intention is to accomplish evil. Step three of ethics. If the action and the intent are good, are the circumstances also good? For example, I could spend an hour praying because I want to get to heaven. That's a good action. However, if I spend that hour praying when I'm supposed to be working, well, that makes the action evil. Therefore, you must never do that, as long as the circumstances are evil. Now, most moral questions fall into one of these three categories. The action itself, the intention, and the circumstances. And these alone are hard for most people to follow. However, some people will raise other kinds of issues, alleged gray areas in morality, that require further ethical rules to resolve them, usually having to do with the practice of law or medicine. Step 4 of Ethics If the action, intent, and circumstances are good, but something evil also takes place as a result of my good action, can I still do the action? This is what's called the principle of double effect, and the answer is yes, under certain conditions. Those conditions are, the good must not come about as a direct result of the evil, because this would just be rationalizing evildoing for the purpose of some good outcome. The foreseeable good that comes from the action must be greater than the evil, because otherwise evil advances more than good. And finally, the good consequences must be at least as directly connected to your action as the evil consequences. For example, if I receive a birthday gift containing a game I really wanted, and a really dangerous helicopter toy with whirling blades, the act of opening the gift may cause evil if my niece pokes her eye out with the helicopter toy. However, that evil is not a direct result of me opening the gift, so I'm fully justified in opening it. However, if instead of a helicopter toy it contains a jet of sulfuric acid that would automatically melt the person who was closest, well... I'd be fully justified in not opening it, because that would cause evil more directly than good. Step 5 of Ethics If I'm up against a wall and I have to choose between two evil actions, and I choose one of them, have I done evil? Well, that depends. If you chose the evil that did the least harm, and if there was absolutely no way of avoiding both evil actions, then you did the right thing. For example, if I'm forced to choose between stealing one dollar from a very rich person and stealing a hundred dollars from a person who can't afford the loss, both of those actions are evil, but the degree of evil is greater in one case than in the other. Obviously, the first obligation is to avoid doing any evil actions, but if one evil action must be done in order to keep from doing a worse one, you may. Remember, though, this isn't some loophole to justify evil. Evil is still wrong, and the objective of this rule is, when you get down to it, to do as little evil as possible in your particular circumstances. Step 6 of Ethics If I help someone knowing that he has an evil intention, and he does evil deeds because I helped him, am I to blame for his evil? If you helped him with the intention of him doing or spreading evil, then yes, you are to blame. That's called formal cooperation with evil. If you didn't share his evil intent, but his actions would have been impossible without your help, then you are still guilty, because you knew what he was planning and you went along with it for some other reason. That's still evil. On the other hand, if you helped him under duress, like someone's got a gun to your head or something, then you did evil, but don't have nearly as much guilt because of it. A good example of this is voting. If you vote for a candidate who supports legalized assassination because he supports legalized assassination, well, that's a grave evil. 
If you vote for him because of some other policy he has, that's still a grave evil, unless his opponent condones a worse evil. This is particularly bad when his victory wouldn't have been possible without your help. However, if you vote against him, and he gets into office anyway, and begins to use your taxes to murder people in the millions, you're not guilty of evil. Evil is being perpetrated on you because your right to make ethical choices is being infringed on, but it's not your doing. Once these basic steps are followed, virtually all ethical dilemmas evaporate into thin air. This doesn't mean it's easy to do the right thing, it's still really, really hard. But what's not hard is figuring out what the right thing is. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.